Hello everyone, welcome, my name is Phoenix and this is the Consumer's Guide to Filmmaking. John Wick, Chapter 4, 2023, Chad Stahelski. Taking place sometime after the events of Part 3, John Wick is living underground with the Bowery King, planning his revenge against the Assassin's Guild in their high table. Meanwhile, a powerful member of the guild known as a Marquis hires a hitman named Kane to hunt down Wick. Traveling across the globe, Wick must find a way to end the guild's hunt for him before they succeed in taking his life. Ignoring certain... information... This was a satisfactory ending to this series. A very entertaining, if self-indulgent, action epic. Since this is, you know, John Wick, we get our heaping... We get our usual heaping helping of action set pieces, but this time, the directors were clearly aiming to make something super garish and over the top, all while retaining their eye for good action. Some of these set pieces, while having issues that I will discuss later on, were damn fun. A ton of creativity went into constructing these gimmicks. A fight at the Osaka Hotel in a similar glass area as the one in Part 3 in New York, I think that fight was set in, was baller. The entire fight in that busy roundabout in France was fucking wild, and that must have been a fucking nightmare to coordinate. Oh my god. Even if it was, you know, a little long, I'll touch on that later, but it, it was wild. But oh my god, that action scene in this old, under-construction building was fucking wild. When the camera went top-down, and it went full fucking Hotline Miami, I, oh my god, I was very close to having an erection. Seriously, Donation Games, reskin Hotline Miami as a John Wick game, and give us that shit fucking pronto. In watching this film, though, I feel I have to give some credence to the sort of normal cinematography and editing in the film. These films are no slouch in that regard, and I actually really noticed it this time around. The conversations and quieter scenes all had some highlights to them that impressed me. My favorite was the conversation between Wick and the Osaka hotel owner. The start of that scene sees Wick being introduced and he's fully enveloped in this neon red from a nearby sign. It was really stark and fit the tone of the scene really well. Another shot that caught my eye was this far pan in a museum while Ian McShane walked in front of all these 18th century paintings. A lot going on in that shot, I must say. While that isn't the focal point of these films, I had to give moments like those their flowers. Music once again plays a big role in the film, and with this one, I felt like they were moving back once again to a more industrial and electronic sort of feeling for the score. I dig that a ton. It really makes the set pieces pop, and it gives them that throbbing, pulsing rhythm that keeps things moving. The top-down Hotline Miami bit really worked well with the electronic music. I mean, someone working on that film must have played the games, because that's what those games were all about full review of Hotline Miami 1 on the channel. Anyways, <laughs> there was even a small hint of music that sounded like it was from a western, and for good reason, since it was during the final, like, gun duel. Well, it didn't go far enough with that at the end. I still dug the use of, you know, western-style music. The only iffy part of the music was, you know, the licensed music, the soundtrack. There was this one moment during a section with its own problems entirely, and the dialogue started hinting at a particular song, and I was like, don't, don't play that fucking song, do not play that fucking song, and then they played the fucking song and I died of cringe. Fuck me. Moving on. Writing-wise, the film functions more or less, and it does have its strong elements. I like this attempt at really thinking about whether John is too addicted to the game. Everyone keeps hinting that the only way he'll have peace is him dying. And the ending was just that. After getting shot up and then pulling a fast one on the big bad, killing him in the process, Wick walks off, but with his wounds too severe, he sits down and he thinks about his late wife. He dies thinking about the only thing that gave him hope. And just as he wished, his epitaph read on his tombstone, Loving Husband. While all this sort of stuff wasn't ever meaningfully explored in these big action extravaganzas, it was nice that they brought it up in this one. However, the biggest problem I have with this film is that it is just too fucking long. 
clocking in at just under three hours. Certain set pieces and dialogue scenes either took way too long to get to the point or were absolutely fucking needless. The fight through Paris could have been shaved down a ton. That fight in the underground nightclub and casino was a tad much. And again, dialogue scenes could have been cut fucking completely. You could easily shave a solid 30 minutes off of this film and it would be all the better for it. Further, speaking of that nightclub casino fight, that shit was kind of dumb. We had this big hoss guy doing fucking spin kicks and fancy karate, and I'm supposed to believe this bulbous asshole can do that? <laughs> Seriously, just have the hoss fight like a hoss, and it would make sense. Acting-wise, everyone turns up and turns out for this film. Keanu is here and he's just as charming as ever. There's nothing to report really there. Bill Skarsgård comes in as the Marquis, and while I found his villain to be a little weak from a writing perspective, he gave an entertaining performance. Very shit heel villain that comes off as incredibly threatening and unstable. That sort of shtick. We also have Donnie Yen absolutely killing it in this film as Kane, and his physical performance was god tier. The blind fighting was really believable and flowed realistically, as realistic as a film like this can be. We also have Shamir Anderson as the Tracker, aka Mr. Nobody, and his interactions with Reeves and Skarsgård showed a good chemistry with the cast. Ian McShane in this film was a highlight, though. Along with his usual charm, there were these subtle moments of emotional impact that I noticed that really wowed me. The most obvious one being when Wick asks if he can get a ride home and Winston is like, of course. As Wick walks off, Winston looks like he's about to cry, as he knows that this was the end for John Wick. Also, Lance Reddick's appearance in this film was kinda grim, given the context of everything that had happened around the time of this film's release. But, you know, he was charming, R.I.P. You know, love that guy. Absolute legend. Oh, uh, Clancy Brown and Lawrence Fishburne were there as well. They were good. Love those guys. Great cast. Love it. <laughs> In the end, John Wick 4 does most of what a concluding section of a story should. It ups the stakes to new heights and ups the ante in terms of action. It's big, it's garish, and I like me a big garish spectacle. But with that though, there are also hints of self-indulgence, as this film was too long for its own good. Still, this film was a fun time, and I look forward to never seeing one of these again, as the idea of a fifth one was smelled too much like Studio Greed. If you're a John Wick fan, this film is probably one you've already seen, but for the casual, you know, film-goer, action fan, John Wick 1, 3, and 4 make a solid trilogy, and you should give these films a go. And I am feeling a 6.5 to a 7 out of 10 on this one. It's closer to a 7 than a 6.5 because it's a big spectacle and it's lots of fun. Good time. Catch you later, guys.